if during this session you have like a very um, very very strong desire to tweet about this is the hashtags that you can use if you have very very strong desire for taking pictures of some slides I would you know save save your uh, room because if you go to this link all the slides code and video will be posted there <laughs> this is good one so this is exactly what you need to do this is one slide that you want to take a picture rest of it you should you know sit here relax enjoy or maybe not relax so um, you will be um, participating and show me if I will I will do some uh, live coding hopefully and uh, if I will break something, you will help me to fix it. All right? Okay. So let's uh, let's start. I guess it's a 4:45. Uh, if someone someone else will come, it's also great. Last minute check. It's talk about Java. Anyone? Java. It's talk about Spring Boot, Spring Framework. It's talk about <coughs> distributed caching. We're in the right place, right? It's good. <coughs> So, um, as you understand, this is now we have already if everything set up. Everything, um, everything is good. And today we're going to talk about caching, um, and uh, you know, couple couple phrases that uh, help you to rephrase where or remind what kind of uh, use cases that we're trying to solve here. So, one of the things that we do with caching is we're trying to solve some performance problems. Uh, because um, certain operations, certain things that we do in, 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 in computer science um, or like in, in computing in general uh, require um, hard computation but may some, take some time and if um, results are important, you can actually save result for uh, further use. So in this case you can improve uh, performance of application. Um, also you can offload as a, as a part of the performance use case, you can offload certain operations into the cache, and in this case, uh, cache will 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 be your um, you know fast access uh, storage for um, retrieving certain data. Um, in many caching solutions, you can um, fully use hardware, so you can scale up your application using uh, all available uh, memory in your system. If using um, when we're talking like about caching, we're talking about memory because memory is usually faster than getting something from the disk. Even though there are some uh, solutions that provide caching uh, on the disk because it might be faster than retrieving from the network, so everything is relative. Or you can use a scale out if we're talking about distributed caching solution. With scale out, we um, we bring in more machines into the play by cre in creating a shared memory. So in most cases, uh, we're going to talk about some scale-out use cases today with Spring Boot. And um, usually, uh, caching is something that's easy to apply and doesn't require uh, much of effort, right? Hopefully. All right. So I think you saw enough some slides uh, today. So this is why I was thinking that maybe you know some code, some live coding, and uh, we can talk in real stuff. So. <laughs> Uh, if you uh, if you heard about uh, uh, Spring Boot, and uh, if you heard about um, the Spring technology in general, most likely you're familiar with Josh Long. And as Josh Long, I also have two very uh, very um, sweet places where I want to be. The first place is production. Right? Everyone wants to be in production. Production is awesome. Everyone needs to be in production. And the second thing that allows you to go to production faster is the website called start.spring.io. It's an awesome website. If you're doing a lot of Spring and uh, these days Spring Boot development, you can go there and um, start or bootstrap your project without you know, starting over. Because if you're starting a new project, you usually either copy paste some stuff from, some, from other projects Still will require some time. Start.spring.io is an awesome place. So um, I prefer to use Gradle. Um, Gradle, anyone? For those people who don't make poor life decisions, they use Gradle these days? That's only me. Okay, that's fine. So it's, it makes it to two of us. Um, uh, what are you guys using for Bill? Maven. Maven. And? Anyone? And? 
okay, we can still be friends. It's all right. Can we? We will try. We were good guys. Okay, so um, I will create some of the, 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 the testing, uh, the caching project, and um, it's called presentation. And the cool part about this website, and the cool part about uh, the, the, the starters projects of the, for the Spring Boot is that you can enable certain uh, technologies um, by enabling different starting projects. And for caching use case, they also have uh, the starter project. So I will use this one as a starter point for, for, for this for this presentation, and um, when I type cache, it shows me here. So when I click generate project, it will download zip file, which will contain all required um, dependencies. And um, let's take a look at this one. So the, the way how it looks like right now, it has um, two classes, one demo application, another a test application, and uh, the build.gradle, which contains um, this uh, cache starter project that will bring all dependencies that we need to use caching with Spring, with Spring Boot, and we will modify hopefully a couple files here, not 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 many files. All right. So in um, in this particular scenario, I want to introduce you to very interesting use case. So I have a service that will accept parameter which represents state and will return some of the city from the state. And um, this service looks like this, this interface. Here's gonna be very, 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 very serious warning. Do not do this in production. Do not do this in your, um, in your real projects. Always put your interfaces, your classes into separate, uh, in separate files I'm doing this only for sake of demo because I don't want to lose your attention because not many of you here, I don't want to lose you. So this is why everything is going to be on the one file. Okay? So um, I'm going to do this disclaimer. So I have an interface uh, that will represent my service. Now, to use this, I need to implementation of this one. In the real world, you're creating an additional class that implements this interface. But uh, for the sake of demo, I will do something like this. So in this case, I have an inline implementation that will create service. And um, if you're familiar with the concept of uh, uh, the beans, basically it's uh, the, the method get uh, CT service. It's basically a factory that returns instance of the particular of particular Java class. In my case, uh, with uh, Java 8 syntax, Java 8, anyone? Cool stuff. Uh, cool stuff. So in this case, um, because it is interface has just a one method, I can replace it with just lambda. And uh, as, a, uh, as a parameter of my method, I will receive uh, the name of the state. And if it's Ogayo, I will return Sandansky uh, city. And if it's other state, I don't really care, right? <laughs> Cares about it. So we are in Ohio, and it's uh, Sandansky uh, uh, Kalahari Resort. All right, now, uh, who can tell me how can I proceed here? Like what I need to do to make it work. So I will see some of the output of this class. What I need to have. So again? Exactly. Where are we wiring usually, usually in, uh, in the Spring Boot applications or in Spring applications? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So any component, basically, right? So we can take any component. In uh, Spring Boot, there is a very interesting, there is very interesting uh, component that allows you to um, perform certain operations during startup of the applic uh, application, command line launcher. So let me put this here. So in my, uh, this is my component. And as gentleman mentioned here, I need to auto wire. So what's the correct way to auto wire, uh, auto -wire dependency in your class? Who's a constructor? That's my boy. Okay, so, but I'm not gonna do this. I'm just do, you know, nasty stuff with uh, the property. Uh, but you know that you need to do with, um, um, you need to do this with right way. And if you're using the right tools for, uh, for, for your development, like IntelliJ IDEA, IntelliJ IDEA will always, like a best friend, will always suggest you, you're doing something stupid. See, and uh, you know, if you see this like a squiggly, usually it's something interesting there. So this is why you need to use like either setter or it's better even constructor, right? So, but for the sake of demo, that will work. Okay, 
Now, so to test this application, if it works, if it's not, so let's see. Um, so best way to test it, uh, get city, and we call it like this. Okay. And when I run this demo application, it should show me very famous uh, Spring Boot banner. Yes, check. And it's result. Cool enough, right? Now, so we, when we're talking about performance, when we talk about performance, we usually talk about things like measuring performance or benchmarking, right? How many of you been, write a benchmark in your life? Seriously? No one? How many of you are using right tools of writing benchmarks? Like JMH, Java Micro Benchmark Harvest? No one. Okay, how many of you benchmark your code with uh, uh, system get uh, nanos or system dot current mills? Anyone? Come on, guys. We win a good win. The, it's, it's a friendly area, so no shame here. And uh, I'm gonna use this uh, very awesome way called system dot nanos, Nan, uh, and uh, we're gonna use it in uh, uh, in, in in my in my in my code here so where's my two 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 uh, company service benchmark okay so very 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 nice thing to to do is uh, the system dot uh, nano time and uh, uh, print the result into the into the console so if I will run it it will print some some of the information about uh, how this thing gonna run? So let me put this on the on the other side. Let's do this. Uh, move to right. Okay. So now you know we're running this. Get some some results. That's pretty cool. So, but in real life, or maybe in the life of uh, microservices, when to get some data, we not always need to rely on some hard coded values. We might rely on database, or we might rely on the call on some external web service. So in this case, introducing this kind of uh, dependencies will increase latency in our applications. To introduce latency in my application, this is what I usually do um, in in future. I use very powerful technique. Um, it's called slip. It's a very powerful technique. So now I kind of make this look like I'm calling external service, which is somewhere in Australia. So it takes some time. So if I run this, let's, let's see if it actually does something with this call. And when I call this service, the, I imagine that my call goes through the time and space, through the wires uh, and on the other side of the world when the people walking upside down and it got it result. But I need to call, do another call to this uh, uh, Australian service, right? So in this case, it will take me another 10 seconds to wait. So this is kind of premise. This is kind of problem that we're trying to solve. We will try to solve. Um, in, in this particular example, it's going to be sleep. By uh, removing sleep, you might solve many problems. This is how the modern software development is done. Every time when you read and release notes, we improve performance in same times. Most likely, they remove sleep somewhere. Because the marketers, they said, okay, they put sleep, so the next release will be faster. They will pay us more if it's going to be faster. You guys, I'm just kidding. It's, 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 a, it's a joke. You need to smile. It's, it's kind of fun session. All right. Anyway, so now how we can fix this? So with Spring, uh, since version, I guess, Spring 3, they introduced a very powerful thing called Spring Caching Abstraction. So basically, it's ability to, uh, for Spring to generate proxies uh, of these certain methods. And uh, instead of like, calling this method over and over again, they will cache uh, result. So and very, um, I think, intuitive and very simple way how we can enable it by uh, writing a nice annotation called enable caching. This is very obvious, right? Not. So we enable caching globally. Now we need to tell exactly what kind of stuff we want to cache here. So in this particular situation, we're interested in the result of get city method. So what we're going to do this, uh, cache cacheable. And uh, we call this cache city. Now, by adding this to 
very nice annotations. Let's see how it um, helped uh, improve our uh, performance of our application. So now we're still going through time and space the first time because Spring doesn't know anything about how to get the result we're going from time and space into the Australia to invoke this method. And the second call didn't take any time because the result was cached. Now, by bringing two annotations, I'm giving you a secret. So by bringing these two annotations in your code, you can show your boss how you can improve performance in 10,000 times. Imagine that, right? So, um, the way how it works with Spring. Spring comes with a default implementation of Cache Manager, which is based on concurrent hash map. So, the, basically, who else here wrote Cache using concurrent hash map in their lives? Once. Everyone. It, it's what we do, right? The concurrent hash map, it's a simple key value, NoSQL, in process cache that you can use. It's not literally cache because there are certain things that you cannot do with concurrent hash map. You cannot evict, you cannot expire entries. They sitting there uh, waiting for out of memory exception. But with um, other solutions, um, we will try to improve this situation. So luckily, um, Spring has support of many uh, caching frameworks um, uh, 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 built on top of this uh, caching abstraction. So in this particular um, in this particular session, I want to introduce you to Hazelcast, which is, um, first of all, it's, it's a memory data grid. What in memory data grid, you might ask? So it's three simple things. It is storage, it is computing platform, and it's messaging platform. So by storage, um, it is just a simple key value storage. Imagine Java map, Java util map, very simple key value storage. Taking this into, taking this abstraction into a distributed world makes it very nicely um, uh, to, to, for Java developers to use it very easily because many Java developers, they know what is the Java map. If they take this um, API into distributed world, uh, it will, will does the same. So to make it work with uh, Spring Boot and the Spring, it's actually very easy. And it's not only with Hazelcast. The many, uh, uh, many caching solutions that Spring guys support, they work very similarly here. So to, to, uh, to enable this integration, we need to do two things. So first of all, we need to add jars. We need to bring actual dependencies. So in this case, we need to add uh, uh, eight, eight ish uh, megabyte of dependencies uh, from um, Hazelcast. Okay, now, and we need to tell Spring Boot that, okay, so we're gonna use the Hazelcast instead of concurrent hash map. So what's the, you know, best way to do this? Is created bin. Say it again? Application and properties, but in this case, I wanna be like more explicit, so I will just simply create a bin. So I will simply create a bin. And uh, you actually mentioned this right, because uh, Spring Boot has support of auto configuration with Hazelcast, so it, it, they, they can support it uh, through application properties. You can create uh, Hazelcast config, Hazelcast instance, and they support all this stuff. So they already implemented all this magic. So what you need to do is just to use this, uh, this magic in, in, uh, in this application. So the way how it looks like, this bin will, uh, will create um, the instance of uh, Hazelcast. So in this particular scenario, Hazelcast will be, um, um, how it's called, like embedded uh, piece, uh, embedded cluster in your application. So instance of the Spring Boot application will essentially be a member of the cluster. So when I will run this, when I will run this the first time, and if, um, if you remember, when you run it like multiple times, the, the concurrent hash map uh, implementation, there is, um, each and every time it's going to be a new start and you're losing the data uh, because it, it's just simply stored in, in the memory of the process. So when the process is um, ended, um, data will be lost. Now, so what happens here? The, the, this output means that now this application is a member of the cluster. Uh, uh, there is only one member here. And still, first call still takes time to compute. There is no magic here. Now, second call was cached inside the Hazelcast. 
So what if I will start another instance of this application? So I will do another one. Now I'm running two applications, two Spring Boot applications. They're starting. Uh, this second instance of application will also create instance of the Hazelcast. Now you see output that now we have a cluster of two nodes. And for the second application, data was already there. Data was already cached in, um, in another node of the cluster. So first call took just eight milliseconds. So if I will start another member, if I will start another application, I just want to make sure that this is clear for everyone, that data was already stored somewhere else in memory, in other process. In this case, we have distributed application, which contains three nodes, and the first call takes 17 milliseconds. And the second call takes almost, uh, almost zero, right? Still, you know, we're trying to be a uh, perfectionist here. We're trying, we want to sort of fight through all our obstacles. We're still thinking, okay, so what we can do with this, with this nasty guy? Still, we need to do something. So in the caching world, um, in certain things, what you can do is preheat your cache, right? So as I already mentioned in the very beginning when I said, like, you can sort of um, offload some pieces of a computation into the cache um, for, the, for the reason that, for the further use. So this why, how about we, um, we actually offload this guy from here? Like, we remove it from, from part of our application and we will make it um, some separate entity, right? So, uh, if we do this, because essentially what we want, we want to have very fast and uh, responsive uh, Spring Boot application. And we don't really need to, uh, don't need to think where this data will be stored. But we, we still need to think. But in general, uh, we separating our topology. Now, we're moving from embedded configuration uh, which is, um, has Hazelcast instance inside your Spring Boot application into a very simple um, client cluster configuration. So, I'm creating, uh, no. so sometimes people are asking, okay, so how I will, how I can, you know, install Hazelcast or how can you come to our place and install Hazelcast for us? Because uh, sometimes people, when they hear the words like distributed cache, they're thinking, okay, maybe it's something like extreme scale, IBM extreme scale, where is the, the web sphere? We need to install the web sphere first, and after that, uh, IBM extreme scale, and we need to do it for multiple, it's gonna be madness. We need to a bunch of consultants that will, you know, rip us off. With um, Hazelcast is just a one jar, one jar which is eight megabyte. And uh, the simple possible way how we can start member of of, uh, of the cluster, you already saw this. Uh, you already saw this how I did this in uh, in the Spring Boot application. But this is simplest possible cluster application. So if I will start this, um, if I will start this um, uh, uh, the client cluster class multiple times, you will see something like this. So we will see. We will see um, how that we're starting Hazelcast. We're using default parameters. By default, um, Hazelcast uses multicast. And it's actually very interesting because um, I just realized that it's not always working in conference Wi-Fi, but it does work here. So it's great uh, that uh, multicast works here. So multicast is used for discovery. So nodes will, uh, when they start, uh, uh, they will uh, try to listen uh, some UDP packages uh, about announcement if there are any other clusters in, in, in this network. But um, usually, you know, people just stick to um, traditional TCP configuration. So once they found ourselves in, 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 this, in this area, um, let me start another one to demonstrate how it works. Then uh, they switch to TCP communication. So they, uh, TCP, um, TCP communication, uh, we, we use TCP communication because we um, rely on um, delivery of packages of TCP. So we need to have some sort of more or less reliable uh, communication. Now, uh, this, this means that I started my 
I started my cluster of, of two nodes. Now, in my application, in my Spring Boot application, the, um, I still have this guy. So, I have a bin type of Hazelcast instance. Uh, the good thing is that Hazelcast member API and Hazelcast, um, and Hazelcast client API, they are returning the same Hazelcast instance. So, I can simply do something like this, Hazelcast. Hazelcast client, new Hazelcast client. So, so in my application, I can even use the power of Spring profiles and switch uh, from um, embedded configuration where I have Hazelcast built in. For example, I'm doing testing on my local, I just want to build uh, the, the local cluster. But in, in my production, I just want to connect to some cluster that I already have. So I can have two profiles, which one will use a bin that returns client instance, and uh, I will use the bin that returns uh, the member instance. So if I will run this, oh no, it reminds me. So um, now, I rem we, we struggling with this like a first start, right? So the first call takes 10, uh, 10 seconds for us. So now we need to outsource it somewhere. And because I already have a cluster uh, running, now I want to, you know, this data will be available there. So if I will return back to my cluster member, and I will simply do change it a little bit. So in, um, in what actually happens here? So when the spring works with the Hazelcast as a provider of cache, um, it operates with a native data structure called uh, IMAP. So IMAP, essentially, it's extension of Java Util Map or the concurrent map, you would say, because um, the put of absent uh, methods uh, that came from concurrent, uh, concurrent map, uh, its interface. Um, and uh, here I'm just simply pre-populating some data. So I want to have fast start from my, for, my, um, for my application. And I'm doing this. And I will start another one. So we still have a cluster of two. Uh, I will explain why I need to have two. I will show you something cool after. Now, oh, we have even three still running something. Okay, three. It's even better. Now, in my uh, in my client application, I will start client application, and let's see. Now, first call took just one second. And the reason for that is that Hazelcast client is lazy. So when we start the application, um, the client will not establish connection only unt until time. It will establish connection to only one member. Member that will represent um, like the oldest member of the cluster. Only after we need this data, client will establish uh, a connection to the actual member that holds this data. So this is why the first call takes one millisecond because um, it still needs to establish connection to the cluster. But still pretty cool, right? We have a 10 uh, seconds. Now we, we, we reduce startup time to, um, to one second. So if I run this once again, so it's going to be instance of another client. They're using the same shared, you see, they're, using, they're connected to this cluster. First call, second call, almost, almost immediately. In um, Hazelcast client actually has a functionality that allows you even um, reduce network calls. It's called uh, near cache. With near cache, um, you can do um, so. Once your data was retrieved, you know one one single time, you don't need to go to uh, to the cluster and request it once again. It's already in your near cache and it will just be reused. So in this case, it would be uh, this, uh, the, all these like, subsequent calls that will be even faster. Now, fast. Now, uh, you might say, okay, so why are you talking about this Hazelcast thing? So, and I'm also thinking why I'm talking about this Hazelcast thing. So what if you decide to go to somewhere, some other solution, some more expensive, maybe closed sourced, um, I don't know. Uh, not open source solution. Anyways, you want to get rid of Hazelcast for some reason, right? And what you need to do? You need to rewrite your application? Uh, absolutely not. Because um, there is a, a Jcash specification. How many of you heard about Jcash? It's kind of interesting, interesting piece of Java world. So 
Um, the JKR standard was initially started back in 2001. And if you if you kind of following the GSR, uh, Java community process type of thing, JSR number for JKR is 107. 107 is one of the longest uh, the JSRs that running. So uh, it was um, it was released I guess in 2014, um, and right now there's a bunch of implementations of JCache which are in process. For example, HCache, um, for example, Caffeine, or some distributed like Hazelcast, Oracle Coherence, and Finispan from uh, from Red Hat. So. And the idea of Jcache is to provide API, like uh, the, the common API between different systems that, um, that you can basically switch different uh, implementations without losing uh, functionality. So this is what we tr will try to do here. We will throw away any, um, any um, sort of traces of Hazelcast from our code by bringing Jcache, right? So it, it, it's still pretty cool stuff, right? Because removing the code makes it better, right? So you, if you're removing uh, in your code and everything works the same, you're making code better. Uh, so for, to bring the jcache, we need to go to our uh, oops, go, go. Um, So the way how it looks like, Everything starts with Java X, meaning it's a standard piece, right? So we bring in um, a JKH jars. We go in uh, to our application. We removing Hazelcast from here. Remove it. Okay, no Hazelcast. Also, because uh, because we're relying on Spring caching abstraction, we also rely on on cache on uh, Spring uh, annotations. I also don't want this. So um, if you see this cache result, oh, sorry, cacheable, uh, it comes from the spring cache annotation. I don't want this. I want to use standard. So in this case, I do cache result uh, with cache name equals city. Now, and it's good enough. For now, um, so we, we remove this in our application. We're just only using uh, Spring and Jcache. And uh, the good thing about uh, uh, Spring Cache and abstraction that starting from Spring Framework 4, they fully support the Jcache um, annotations. So uh, they, they sort of interchangeable between cache and abstraction, but you know, they are standard. So in this case, um, it, it's better to use the standard annotations. Now, um, the way how it works with Spring Boot, Spring Boot also has a bunch of magic to identify where everything is uh, sitting there. So Spring Boot also support Jcache. So if there is a Jcache jars in your class path, Spring Boot will start Jcache caching provider, and rest of the magic will be done by Jcache SPI. So Jcache SPI works pretty straightforward. Um, each and every implementation of Jcache, um, let me check, uh, let me show you with the Hazelcast, for example. Inside uh, the very um, secret, uh, uh, secret place called Amiata INF services, there is a Java X JCache SPI caching provider file. This file actually points to uh, actual provider of the JCache. So this is kind of uh, this is how this JCache magic works. So when you do the caching dot get caching provider or get cache, um, it will go to this file, instantiate this guy. And after that, we'll trace, or we'll, um, we'll forward all calls to, to, this, to this guy. And uh, the Spring guys, they also wrap this functionality into um, a caching, um, caching uh, abstraction. And it, it simply works. Now, um, because we're sticking into this uh, client cluster topology, we still need to do some modifications on, uh, we need to start Jcache um, compatible, um, Jcache compatible, um, Server. Um, it's it, it is easy to do, um, and uh, let me let me show you how you can do it. Very interesting thing that um, you will not see with uh, concurrent hash map, for example, is ability to listen certain changes into the cache. So Jcache defines API for listeners, so you can intercept everything, every event that happens in the cache. Um, 
and uh, you can do some reactive stuff on this. So data will arrive, you can call something else, you can set up some notification mechanism. So that's why I want to demonstrate to you how you can listen um, of certain events on, on the cache um, that happens in, in, in this particular scenario. I'm not going to pre-populate this intentionally to demonstrate to you how the listener will work. So in this case, I do have, um, uh, I do have my listener. So the way how it looks like, uh, Jcache actually provides some interfaces that we need to implement. Cache entry, uh, cache entry created listener um, that has a method on created, uh, and that will receive the some um, list of events. Um, basically, the w why are they doing this? Um, um, like it's horrible, not just one event because um, some of the events they they might batch and send uh, in. Um, in a, in a batch mode. Some events might arrive just one by one. They also support synchronous and asynchronous delivery. So once you're putting something into the cache synchronously, this method will be invoked, or it can be asynchronously. This is why you will, might receive um, the batch and stuff. So it's very, very, uh, very useful and very neat, um, uh, very neat functionality. Now, I need to uh, register this listener somehow. So in this case, uh, um, you you might you might recognize like your favorite enterprise type of stuff because there is a factory uh, there is a factory builder of uh, listener there is a configuration so it's it's Java right it's it's cool stuff it's a factory of builders builders of factory it's pretty cool now and uh, with Hazelcast um, we actually extracting uh, the caching provider to to put from the Hazelcast instance you see. So this is the way how Hazelcast um, um, can access to Jcache uh, functionality from Hazelcast instance. But there is also like simple, simple way something like something like uh, oh, sorry, uh, caching uh, get oops caching caching. Uh, caching and get caching provider get cache manager so this is this is standard API this is a little bit of um, um, Hazelcast wrapper to get access to underlying provider um, in uh, recent releases we actually provide the way much simpler but I just want to make it explicit to demonstrate how I can register um, this listener now so when I will start this member So when I will start this member here, um, now I will be able to connect here from my application. So remember, I removed all um, I removed all uh, mentions of uh, uh, Hazelcast. So that's why it, here it will work through uh, Jcache. Because I didn't populate this, the first call still will take uh, 10 seconds, but you can do the same uh, with uh, Jcash. Um, uh, you can also pre-populate. But what I wanted to you to show uh, is on the cluster member, oops, sorry, wrong one, so many, uh, where's my cluster member? No. Um, as you can see here, when my method uh, from uh, cache was invoked, my listener actually catch, uh, caught this, um, this event with key Ohio and uh, Sandusky, as, uh, Sandusky as, the, as a result. So, um, cool enough, right? Any questions? Okay, so now let's let's recap. So we saw a bunch of weird code, right? Um, but essentially, what you what you oh, okay, start start over, right? Not many slides, okay. So essentially, what you just saw it was three pieces. We started with slow application, even though we introduced the slowness, but it's not uh, the case in the real world scenario. Um, we, uh, we started with this problem by activating uh, caching abstractions from Spring. We enabled uh, caching 
and we used concurrent. It, it's, it's actually, for many cases, it might be good enough, right? If you're not caching zillions of entries, like tons of data, um, this approach is actually works pretty well, right? Uh, but you need to take care, uh, you need to watch for, uh, for this concurrent cache map that uh, used by default in Spring. Right. If if you if you caching like just like small uh, small amount of data, it's fine. You don't need to go with distributed cache. Sometimes people say, "Oh, what I'm doing when I'm running when I'm running um, the edge cache or concurrent hash map versus Hazelcast, it it works like slower." Yeah, but think with the Hazelcast is not or any distributed cache. Not not talking about Hazelcast. Any distributed solution. It is not only for uh, speed. Right, because sometimes it is not enough data on one machine. It is not enough, or data is too important to store it in one machine. So that's why the data need to be distributed across multiple machines. So in this case, concurrent hash map always will be faster than Hazelcast cache because Hazelcast cache invo involves a network, it involves the serialization, it involves the backuping of the data, and many other things. Concurrent hash map will be faster if you care about, you know. Uh, or maybe you need to share this data. You need to have one service, one one Spring Boot service that will populate this data, and other services need to take uh, need to read this data also. In this case, distributed caching solution. This is the right play, right way to you to use. Now, and what we changed from the previous previous code is just bringing uh, another bin configuration. If we're working with embedded topology, if we're working the if we take in our application and makes it a um, member of the cluster, um, we're using this bin. Uh, if we're just using a cluster client topology, so in this case we're creating an instance of, of client. So where, uh, where embedded topology wins over um, client cluster? So first of all, embedded topology is much simpler to start with. Development mode. It's great. You can spin up multiple um, uh, multiple services, multiple Spring Boot applications. They form clusters. They can share the data. Very cool. However, if you work with very data intensive application, your shared memory might become a bottleneck. Some of the things that you do with your application uh, in terms of um, accessing the some of the data might be affected by other pieces of application. When you store the data, um, you know, you have a cache in your process and you have some other processing in your application. These pieces can be uh, affect each other because unfortunately in 2017 we still don't have any multi-tenant virtual machines where we can have like uh, the separation of resources, for example. We can say, okay, I want my, uh, this particular data structure will allocate only two gigabyte of memory and does not go any beyond. So, not gonna work. So in this case, the client cluster topology will allow you to uh, have better control over your storage and over your um, consumers of the data. So in this case, um, uh, it's easier to scale when you have two separate pieces. You have you can scale cluster separately. You, you can scale your application consumer separately. It is it is better from perspective of um, of deployment. It's better for perspective of um, maintenance. Uh, and the thing is that if you're changing something, co some code in your application consumer, you don't need to redeploy your cluster because cluster might have uh, gigabytes of data and the data will be stored there. Uh, you don't want to lose this data. And the third thing we bring, uh, we, uh, we brought a standard um, into the play. So going forward, uh, if you don't like Hazelcast, like I said, because there are Many other expensive solutions, uh, worse, slower solutions, some other solutions um, that maybe people selling on the gold fields. Um, you can throw it away, and if they support Jcash, this is your way um, of, of doing things. So, um, but uh, you can ask, okay, so Victor, but what if we we still want to use something that's not available Jcash? So Jcash is API. Key value, you, have, you know the key, you can get the value. You don't know the key, you need to iterate over all entries, and uh, in this case, it's all n task. As many entries you have um, in your cache, you need to iterate over. It's not very efficient. So for example, in Hazelcast API, there is Query API that allows, uh, it's very similar to maybe GPQL, uh, it's called the Criteria API. 
that allows to query writing some predicates. So in this case, um, this kind of stuff goes beyond the standard because in the standard, imagine they, they for uh, like over like 12, uh, 13 years, they couldn't agree about API. What happened if they will try to implement the queries in this? It's, it's going to take another five years to, to negotiate and to, to uh, uh, sort of uh, take care of, the, of, the, of this stuff. So in some cases, if you want to go with some, um, some more advanced features. So for example, I mentioned that Hazelcast is not only about cache, it's also it's a memory grid, meaning that once you have a data, you don't need to move data around to do computation. You can send computation into the grid and run it right next to your data. So in this case, this kind of functionality is sort of available in uh, Jcache. In the Jcache, there is a thing called entry processor, which is essentially um, you know, sending small, of, uh, computation, uh, 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 small computation piece, which is a serialized class. Uh, it will be executed to uh, together with data. Uh, but Hazelcast provides um, distributed executor service, distributed messaging service, um, and etc. So, if you don't need this, if you need simple caching, go with Jcash. Um, uh, well enough supported by many vendors, uh, in process, distributed. Um, if you need more advanced features, um, so in this case, um, you need to stick with some particular vendor. This is kind of you know a typical problem. You might have some common denominator that defines. Um, certain APIs, but you know, if you need to go beyond the standard, uh, you can use, for example, JPA. But if you need to go beyond the standard, you need to stick into the Eclipse Lake or into um, Hibernate or something else. Um, so I will take the questions. Um, it's also another cool slide that you can take picture if you didn't take a picture of the first slide. Um, so in this in this guy, uh, you can find um, uh, you can find slides. You can find uh, the code. Um, and everything that I just uh, talked about, you can find that. If you have some questions, there's a comments form. Uh, you can ask um, any questions about this. Um, and uh, if, you, if something is not clear or something is not working, um, let me know. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. Unfortunately, I don't have it on this slide, but I do have it somewhere here. Yeah, small one. Yeah, you can also ask some questions about um, caching, computing, and distributed systems. Um, so now I, I will take some questions. Huh? People are like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, please. Yeah, so if I want to configure the cache to expire at a single time, let's say entries, how is that set up? And do they expire at the same time in the central distributed cache and at the clients? Do they all, are they all synced to the same power? Okay, I will repeat the question uh, to, uh, to record this. So the question was how the expiration happens and uh, does it happen like synchronously on every, every node or every, every client? This is the kind of question you're asking, so, right? Let's say a, a client comes up and the cache has been alive for 28 minutes, or two minutes until it expires. A brand new client comes up. He knows that he needs to expire in two minutes, not in 30 minutes. Yes. So each and every entry represents, uh, we call it um, entry view. Entry view represents key, value, and uh, time to leave, basically. Um, so in, um, you can do, you can, if you do explicitly, like do puts and gets, you can specify for a particular entry. You can configure on the cache level. You can configure on default level. So there is multiple ways how you can configure expiration. You can configure in Jcache, for example, there is different policies based on time. In Hazelcast, we have more advanced policies where you can even program your own policy, how it's going to be expired. For example, you want to say, after 10 minutes, I want to expire every uh, even key in my map, for example. This kind of logic you can do. So um, uh, this, this information is stored inside the cluster. Uh, so each, like I said, every, each and every um, entry has, um, has information about this expiration time. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it, uh, but yes, information stored in the cluster, client will be, client can subscribe for expiration events. So for example, you can say, okay, I want to listen for, um, for events when this entry will be expired. And it will return, uh, it will get the key value and you can do something with this. You can log it, you can write into some audit file, like that, uh, something like that. Please. 
Okay, so in production environment, um, so basically it's all about productivity. So if you um, find with running Spring Boot actually has not that big overhead with, of running this, but it might give, give you more uh, benefits if you deploy in some like cloud environments because Spring Boot has multiple components that already enable to do cloud discovery, for example, this kind of things. Um, and if you're running like a big distributed cache, in this case, this uh, this overhead is is, is highly negligible. So it, it, I, I don't think I don't think it's it's a problem. I, I saw multiple um, multiple deployments, especially with client. Uh, it, it, it doesn't really client is pretty light. Um, you will get more benefits using Spring than you will do the, everything by yourself. Some people don't like using Spring because they think like it's just you know. Some uh, some stupid magic, but uh, it is actually improves uh, performance. Once you you know know Spring well and you know how it behaves, yeah, you might say okay, it starts longer because it needs to instantiate all these objects. But if you know the Spring, you know how to tweak it, um, and you can make the startup. And again, we're running the server side uh, so server side systems. Start time time is not the most important thing in the server side systems. More like how the application perform for duration of time is more important. So yeah, I don't think it's uh, it's a problem. So I would I would uh, I would deploy with Spring Boot pretty well. Yeah, uh, when you start multiple applications onto each other, how do they determine that they will Okay, so um, the way how it works, um, there's two basic patterns of data distributions. It's replication or partitioning. Um, and uh, with replication, you have copy of the data, each copy of the data on each and every node. Uh, for obvious reasons, uh, uh, replication is not a scalable uh, solution because you will be limited with uh, capacity of the smallest node. With, uh, with partitioning or sharding, you actually not uh, you're not limited by any more machines. You're actually extending your you know your distributed hash map. So. In, uh, if, if they run like with multiple applications, you can define different caches per application. You can come up with some schema based on the, okay, so my application starts uh, with something. So in this case, my caches will be prefixed with a certain way. Um, also, um, if you're running multiple clusters, you need to segregate clusters on the network level. There is a ways how you can do this in Hazelcast, what we call it group ID and, uh, and password basically it defines so if you're running multiple clusters on the same network, this is the way how you segregate this in terms of from one another. It will, Hazelcast will uh, start, will listen, uh, is there any other clusters running? And after that, they will check if the group ID and the password will match. If they don't, so they will not join, it's going to be running as two separate clusters. For the client, you need to specify, um, you need to specify group ID and password to connect to particular cluster. You can segregate it on the network level. You can segregate it on the group ID level. There is also um, there is also a configuration called application token that you can define in uh, in the Hazelcast configuration. So there, there are multiple ways how you can do that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, it's a pretty good question. So with distributed world, uh, changing the data, um, it's kind of tricky because um, the, the, the changes from one place needs to be reflected on the other side. And after that, people start talking about like, how the data is consistent, etc. So if you go in the standard way, get data, modify data, put back, in this case, you might face a situation where your data might be not very consistent because someone else might modify this data during the time where the data will be at your place. So in this case, you need to either do explicit locks, like pessimistic lock, and you can say, okay, I will lock on this particular key, I will do something, and after that I will put back. So this approach is not very good in terms of uh, performance because it will create contention on a particular key. So um, in, uh, in, uh, in memory grids and uh, in distributed caches, approach uh, a little bit more, um, I would say a little bit more change, changes the way how we think about your data. Instead of 
instead of uh, uh, retrieving data and modifying it on the client, you can actually modify this on place, in place, sending by entry processor. So entry processor guarantees you atomic access for this particular data. So data not leaving uh, storage, computation arrive, change the data in place, everyone sees this value. So it's, it's kind of like changing the way how you're thinking about, it's not, uh, thinking about data, it's not like a retrieve and put back, it's just data stays there, I'm just sending command to modify there the data in place. But I explicitly have to call it in this manner. Yeah, there is a, there is a, a API that uh, it's called like execute on key. Another way, um, because, um, because for example, Hazelcast implements um, concurrent map, there are methods uh, like uh, that implements CAS type of uh, access of data, like a replace, for example. Right? If data wasn't changed during the time when you're doing something with data, you, everything will be fine and your data, your modifications will arrive. If your old value will not be equal to the old value that currently in the cluster, your, your change will be uh, uh, rejected. So um, the same way as you do replace in concurrent map, for example. But um, right thing to do uh, without explicitly creating locks around this, it's entry processor. You're just saying, okay, go there, change the salary in place without creating transactions, locks, etc. Because it will be terrible. You know, you have a global lock basically on the particular key and you have multiple readers and writers for this key. Um, it, would, it will not be, you know, very good uh, from performance. I still have one minute. I can answer one more question. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, if you have client, clients that are in the same block, mm -hmm. is there some sort of a data and application error? Uh, let me ask you what kind of uh, other world? Are we talking about C? Are we talking about C? -sharp? Are we talking about Python? Are we talking about Node.js? Android, iOS. So for um, AS, we have a native clients for, um, for C++, for C Sharp, um, uh, for Node.js. There is a REST API. There is a, a mem uh, memcache API. So if you have very legacy clients that work, uh, can work with memcache server, for example, they can connect to Hazelcast cluster as well. So there is a multiple way how you can do this. But the uh, right way to do is use native clients. So, so we have a bunch of native clients for different languages, not only Java. So yeah. All right, uh, thank you very much, guys. Once again, um, the video will be posted here. Um, if you will be kind, go there and rate this talk. If you like it, if you don't like it, then you can suggest something. It will be great. It will really help other people who will attend the conferences. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, Actually, if you will uh, be around here, around night here, we uh, and this gentleman in this fancy hat, we're going to do uh, late night talks at the Java Puzzlers. It's a very entertaining um, type of thing. If you've ever seen uh, George Block and Neil Gaffner doing Java Puzzlers, we're trying to catch up with these guys. So <laughs> it's a kind of uh, hope to see you at, uh, what time is it, like 7.50, 7.30? Yeah. 7.30, okay. So you will be able to grab the beer, you know, have some laughs and uh, yeah, solve and some fancy... Yeah, you represent the whole code match attendees that know Java? Like, this is Hopefully. All. Yeah, th this is all. So you all should come. <laughs> Thank you, guys.